start our service with a little singing this morning. Can you stand with me, please? pray together. This is why we've gathered, Father, to behold you. And we stand before you in awe and in reverence of what a mighty God you are, of what a personal God you are, of what a loving God you are. We're here because we want to behold you more. We want to see you more clearly. clearly. We want to understand you uh, more deeply. We want to walk with you. It's not always easy, and you know we've struggled, and we've struggled even this week. But we know we can still come to you. We can come before you. We can walk with you. And for that, we're very grateful. We thank you that, just as we sang, you are here in our midst. 
We're not asking you to come. We're thanking you for being here. We're thanking you for allowing us to be here with you, with others who know you and want to follow you and want to learn more about you. Open our minds, open our hearts, that as we hear scriptures, as we continue to sing songs, and even as we interact with one another, that in all those things we will say we can behold you. We can see you. I've seen you in the faces of these people. I've seen you in their hearts and in their actions and in their lives. I have seen you as you have changed us from sinners to saints. Thank you, Father, for your presence. Thank you for your gift of life, here and now, and life to come. And we thank you in the name of our Savior, who we behold, who we uphold, and who we love, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks for coming. A couple of things I want to point out. One is there is a calendar in the bulletin. If you see anything we've missed or forgotten, uh, let us know, or anything that maybe we have incorrect. Uh, let us know, and we will pass those things on in the weeks to come. Also in there, uh, Pastor Kent put together a little summary. He tries to do this after, after our conference. He didn't have it last week because, well, we just got back Friday, and, you know, it takes time. Things were busy. Uh, so anyway, here's a, a little summary. If you have questions on any of that, you can talk to Pastor Kent or myself or Jenny, and we'll be happy to share with you um, you know, things that are going on. We told you last week that, um, that we, had, we passed a, a position paper on Scripture and inerrancy, and if you wanted a copy, let us know. A couple of you did. If I just would remind you, if you still would like to have a copy of that, drop a note uh, in the offering plate, and we'll make sure that, um, that you get it. And just a reminder for you, if you see in the bulletin there are a couple things. Uh, next week, there is no Children's Church, fifth Sunday. And on the fifth Sunday, where we usually have a potluck, we're not having the potluck because the Saturday after that is the picnic. There's information about those in the bulletin, so you can look at those. If you have questions on any of the other items uh, in the bulletin, we, you, know, you can uh, ask Pastor Kent or myself, and we'll be happy to uh, help you with that. So uh, thanks for being here. We appreciate it. Pastor Kent is, you're reading first, right? Is going to come and read Genesis 28, if you want to turn there. Genesis 28. In your pew Bible, that's on page 24. Beginning with verse 1. Isaac summoned Jacob blessed him and commanded him, don't take a wife from the Canaanite women. Go at once to Paddan Aram to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father. Marry one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you so that you become an assembly of peoples. May God give you and your offspring the blessing of Abraham so that you may possess the land where you live as a foreigner, the land God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob to Paddan Aram to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Esau noticed that Isaac blessed Jacob and sent him to Paddan Aram to get a wife there. When he blessed him, Isaac commanded Jacob, do not marry a Canaanite woman. And Jacob listened to his father and mother and went to Paddan Aram. Esau realized that his father Isaac disapproved of the Canaanite women, so Esau went to Ishmael and married in addition to his otherwise Mahalath, daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son. She was the sister of Nebaot. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He reached a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from the place, put it there at his head, and lay down in that place. And he dreamed. A stairway was set on the ground with its top reaching heaven, and God's angels were going up and down on it. Yahweh was standing there beside him, saying, I am Yahweh, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your offspring the land that you are now sleeping on. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out toward the west, the east, the north, and the south. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Look, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. 
I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that was near his head and set it up as a marker. He poured oil on top of it and named the place Bethel, though previously the city was named Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, if God will be with me and watch over me on this journey, if he provides me with food to eat and clothing to wear, and if I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. The stone that I have set up as a marker will be God's house, and I will give to you a tenth of all that you give me. Good morning. Our next reading is going to be from Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 12 to 25, and that can be found on page 1041 in your pew Bible. So then, brothers, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. All those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children, and if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, seeing that we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. And not only that, but we ourselves, who have the spirit of the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we were saved, yet hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await for it with patience.
a great gift to be a child of God. Uh, and we celebrate, we celebrate him in the offering. We celebrate that relationship we have to him. We celebrate his openness to us, his reaching out to us, his love, all that he is and all that he has brought us into. As the ushers come forward to receive your gifts and offerings, let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that we are yours. We have a place with you. Even now, we have a place with you. And we thank you for your care and your provision for us as a loving Heavenly Father. And we give back part of what you've given to us that others might come to know you, that others might come to realize uh, what a great God you are, what a loving Heavenly Father you are. So accept this offering as uh, our expression of thanks and praise to you. And use it through the ministries of this church that others might come to know you. Through the ministries of those who are able to come alongside them on the mission field, organizations here in town, that they too might be able to to share the reality of the love of God, the reality of what it means uh, to, to have you as our Father. With thanks we give in Christ's name.
We're going to go ahead and dismiss the children for Children's Church. You know who that kid is? Yeah, me neither. Pastor Kent picked that picture out. Do you know who it is? No. Okay, there's a stranger on the screen, but anyway. We're going to go ahead and dismiss the kids for Children's Church. Go on downstairs with all their folks and uh, take care of that. It seems to me sometimes we don't pay attention to what Jesus said. Oh, what do you think? Um, some things become too familiar to us. I mean, really, that's, that's what I'm thinking of at this point. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I fear that some things have become too familiar to us. Familiar in a way that I think has caused us not to really pay attention, not to really, um, uh, what, what, what we do is we miss some of the impact of what he said. We miss some of the impact of, of what he wants his word to have in our lives. Uh, today we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer, and um, I want to do more than look at it. What, what I want to do today as we go through it, have a time where um, maybe you, maybe you pray while I share a few thoughts, you know, because really that's all I'm going to be doing, um, you know, as, as I share a few thoughts. So if you take your outline, cross out the ING, because I thought later, well, the, the, this really should just be pray. Uh, but at any rate, um, you, you, do what you, you know, do what you want with it there. Um, I, I'm just going to move slowly through the Lord's Prayer and share a few thoughts with you, but let's pray before we do that. Father, thank you for your word. We're going to look into it now, and we really need your help. This is familiar to us. Uh, the, the, these, the, the words, this prayer, it's familiar to us. And sometimes familiarity causes us to uh, not pay attention. We say to one another often, you know, I, I love you, and it almost sometimes becomes automatic, not that it's insincere, but it's not really thought about sometimes. That's what comes when we come across your word. So open our minds, open our hearts to you, that this would be a time in which we meet with you, a time in which we hear from you, a time in which we draw deeper into your word that right now is just pretty familiar to us. Uh, how to help us to set aside the familiarity and to hear your heart as we think through uh, these words you've given us. We pray with thanks in Christ's name. Amen. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. You may have noticed that right there in the top of your outline. Commonly called the Lord's Prayer, um, and, and that's fine. The Lord really prayed in... Um, John 17 is one of the places he really prayed. It, it, often you see where it says Jesus went, oh, he stepped aside, he stepped, stepped aside alone to pray. But that wasn't the only place, you know, he prayed uh, with his people as well. I, I think uh, the challenge here is that this uh, prayer might be recited often, but I don't think it's actually prayed uh, very often. You know, we recite it, but we, you know, Saying the words does not equal praying the words. I find myself sometimes when I'm reading, and it happened to me this morning, I was reading through uh, uh, some, uh, some passages this morning, and they were familiar to me, and I found, oh, my mind is drifting. And you know, I had to stop and go back up and say, you know, Lord, I really want to pay attention. Help me pay attention. That's kind of where we're at. Uh, with, with this here, you know. Um, uh, let's read through it, and then we're going to look again at it a little bit more slowly. You'll notice your outline today is not a fill-in-the-blank outline. I simply put some of the, I, I, I separated the prayer, spread it out with some of the phrases as I'm going to look at them, as I'm going to go through them, and, um, you know, I hope that what you, write, you write down whatever, you know, whatever it is that God may prompt you. <coughs> there will be some things on the screen 
and there'll be some scripture references. Now, I, I didn't include these other scripture references in the outline today, you know, so if you want to jot those down, that's fine. Whatever it is you think that God would want you to write down. Um, as, as we're going through this, to help, you think, to help you think it through, I am simply going to ask a few questions that the verses prompt for me when I pray. You know, and as I stop to think and as I stop to try to pay attention to what it, what it says. And, you know, maybe, maybe God will use them in your life as well. And maybe, you know, maybe it'll be a time of prayer for you that as I'm going through this, um, you know, the sermon, uh, you, you'll just pray as, uh, as we continue to go on through it. And that's okay, you know, because this is a time where we should be connecting with God. Uh, follow along with me, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. He says, therefore, you should pray like this. You see, that's where I got the title, pray like this, because Jesus said, therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, in the verses immediately preceding these, uh, Jesus told the people to be careful not to be like the hypocrites when they pray. He said, don't be like the hypocrites when they pray. You know, he said not to be like them, but I'm afraid sometimes we are like them that we are more like them than we realize. A part of that comes when we pray this prayer simply by reciting it and not by praying it. You know, we just simply say it. We pray it a bit insincerely. A friend shared uh, this quote with us at conference a couple of weeks ago. He said, prayer is about presence before it is about anything else. Prayer doesn't begin with outcomes. Prayer is the free choice to be with the Father, to prefer his company. I thought, man, I, that, that statement just hit me. You know, it is our free choice to prefer the company of God. Prayer is that time for us to align our hearts with Jesus, not to ask him to align his heart with ours. There's a big difference there. Do you understand that? It's not, where we are at, it's not where we are asking Jesus to align his heart with ours. We, are, we should be trying to align our heart with his. We should be asking him to align our heart with his. Too often we go to the Lord and it's like, Lord, here is my list of things I would like you to think in the same vein as I do about. And, 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 you know, that, I think, is not the way to go about prayer. You know, we focus on our, our personal agenda. And if we focus, if we, when we go to prayer, if we focusing, if we are focusing on our personal agenda, we may very well miss what God has for us. Even when we get into a prayer like this that is so well known to us. And I've learned, yet I have, to keep re I have to keep reminding myself that what he has for me is far better for me than what I have in mind for me. See, what God has in mind for me is far better than what I have in mind for me. You know, what I have in mind for me gets too twisted, too easily twisted by so many other things. And sometimes, you know, sometimes... And, and I, have also, I have also learned, and I was reminded of that more than once this week even, that what God has in mind for my family is far better than what I have in mind for my family. I think about, this week I was thinking about some of the things that I thought would be unfolding for some of my kids, some of my grandchildren. And they went a different way. And I'm at the point, and these events are at the point now where I can look back and I can see God's way was so much better than mine. You know, so much better than mine. 
And that prayer is, you know, is coming in line with what God has to say. And sometimes, you know, sometimes what he has for us, you know, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's painful. But one thing that I, I, I do know, you know, that what he has for my life is always best. Not sometimes. What he has for my life is always best. You know, that prayer is coming before God with our heart open to him and as much as we can, our will open to him as well. You know, what we're doing in prayer is we are, we're looking for his wisdom. You know, we're looking for his wisdom. We're looking for his guidance, his knowledge. You know, not ours. It, 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 we're looking for a greater awareness of his presence with us. You know, his love for us and his work in us opening our eyes to him more. Now, the Gospel of Luke often gives us some insights that uh, Matthew and, and Mark don't. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar. John takes a, a little bit different uh, part of it. Matthew, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke focus more on the, the end of Jesus' life. Uh, John focuses a little bit more on the beginning. And then John also, he focuses on the end because what is about half about half the gospel is uh, the last few well, last week of his life last you know few days but um, you know in Luke 11 Luke tells us that these instructions on prayer were prompted by the disciples asking Jesus to teach them to pray just as John taught his disciples to pray now the the, the request was to teach them to pray not to teach them a prayer. Now, having said that, there is nothing wrong with praying Scripture. In fact, praying Scripture is a good thing. You know, and praying this, you know, praying the words of Scripture, uh, you know, they, they, it can, and, and this can be a prayer. But what we want to make sure is that it's not just words we're saying. <clears throat> now, Matthew says that after Jesus talked about the importance of not praying like the hypocrites, not simply saying words like a babbling mantra, that's what he covers in verses 1 through 8, then he says, therefore, therefore you should pray like this. So you're not praying like a hypocrite. He says, therefore you should pray like this. In contrast to the mindless words repeated without any real intent, in contrast to that, he says, pray like this in a manner different than just the mantra approach, in a manner different than just continually babbling, you know, and rather than, and than speaking to God without really thinking about it, without really thinking about what you're saying or why you're saying it, he says instead, rather than that, pray like this. Notice the first two words in this prayer, our Father. That means I'm part of a family. I'm part of a family. Uh, some of us had families growing up and big families, small families. Some of us had good families. Some of us had not so good families. But now we are part of a family, God's family. Galatians chapter 4 says, when the, <clears throat> when the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons, so that we might be adopted into his, that we might be pulled into his family and made every part of much of his, as much of a family as anyone else. And he says we are adopted as sons. Let me remind you once again that son in scripture, when he talks about, and particularly, you know, as we're going through here and what he's talking about when he says son in scripture, the son had a preferred, a preferred, <laughs> preferred, I'll get that word out, a preferred position in the family. Now, you can say that's sexist and stuff. Don't worry about what our world says about stuff. Listen to the reality of God's word. The reality of God's word says we are adopted as sons. Men, women, uh, you are adopted as sons. Why? Because the son had the preferred position in the family then. And all of God's people, all of those who come to a relationship with Christ are adopted in, in that preferred position. He says you are adopted at, <clears throat> as sons. He says, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. That song we're just saying, you are who, who I, I am who you say I am. You know, that, that I am a child of God. I am his child. 
You know, we, you know, our Father, we're part of a family. First Peter chapter 2. He says, uh, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. The family of believers. Love them, he says. Love them. Fear God. Honor the emperor. If I were writing this, I think I might have put that in a little different order. I would have put fear God first. But God led Peter to write, love the family of believers and fear God and honor the emperor. He is our father in the very best sense of that word in every way. You know, we were saying, you know, as we're singing that, you know, and I said, you know, there, in my father's house, there's a place for me. I shared with you before, there wasn't one in my father's house. When I grew up, my father, my biological father, did not have a place for me in his house. You know, he, 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 he left. He didn't care about me. What a difference it is to be part of God's family. You know, he is our father in the very best sense of that word in every way. Not a distant, far off somewhere deity. He is my God who is present with me and who loves me. Our father. That is who I am addressing when I pray. And he says, our father in heaven, dwelling, dwelling in but not limited to that place where he has always been. That is where he is dwelling, but he is not limited to that, that place that he has always existed, that place where he existed as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, interacting and, and planning together as one, yet three distinct persons, yet one God. As I read this, some questions I ask myself. Am I living as a member of his family? Or am I keeping my distance so that people don't label me? Or am I keeping my distance because I don't want to be held accountable? You know, do I reflect the character and traits of my Father in heaven so that others can see him in me? Am I living in the expectation of that greater reward in heaven or am I grabbing for all I can get here on earth? Our Father in heaven goes on he says your name be honored as holy hallowed be your name is what we're used to saying that's treated as sacred treated as holy set apart and treated as holy let your name be treated with reverence is what he's calling us to you know li live in honor and, and to bring honor to his name uh, Peter wrote in, in, uh, in the first chapter he says as obedient children do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance but as the one who called you is holy, uh, I need to switch that. Uh, but as the one who called you is holy, so you also are to be holy in all your conduct. Uh, for it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Your name be honored as holy. You know, as I pray this, I ask myself, have I, have, have I overlooked unholy behavior in myself or in others because I wanted to achieve a certain goal? Because I wanted to get to a certain end? Have I compromised holiness as I've tried to fit in? Have I compromised holiness as I've wanted to be liked? Praying this prayer is an opportunity for me to come clean with God. My holy God. It goes on, your kingdom come. It's remembering that I live here in the United States, but I live as a citizen of his kingdom. Even though I am living here, I am living as a citizen of, of, of his kingdom. I represent my king. I represent my holy God to this world. You know, I place myself under his rule, under his authority as king, my true leader. 
living in his kingdom, I place myself under his rule and authority as he is my king. Even when those around me won't, even when those around me don't do it, I still live under his king, not begrudgingly, but because I know he is the only true king, because I know he is the only real God, he is the only king worthy of my total devotion, he is the only ruler who won't fail me. I'll live now in such a manner to bring kingdom behavior values to all I do. I live now to bring those kingdom values and behavior to who I am. So I ask myself, is my behavior in any way stifling his, is my behavior in any way obscuring his kingdom? Am I making it harder or easier for people to see what it means to be a member of God's kingdom here and now? Does my living reflect that? Have I allowed other loyalties to dictate my words or to direct my behavior? Other loyalty, loyalties other than the spirit of Jesus. Your kingdom come. Your will be done right here, right here on earth, right here on this earth, just as it is in heaven. This is a statement of surrender to his will. That I am surrendering myself to his will, I am not insisting on my will. I am not ins insisting on what I think is bad. Even Jesus, even Jesus, as he walked this earth in his humanity, in one of his darkest moments, he surrendered to the Father's will. As he was approaching the cross, as he knew it was coming with that suffering, with that pain, and he said, Father, if you are willing... Those are powerful words, if you're willing. He says, take this cup away from me, nevertheless. Not my will, but yours be done. What he did is he, he, he bookend, that, he bookend that, you know, that, that request with, I want your will, I want your will. If you're willing, nevertheless, your will be done. If you're willing, here's, here's what's going through my heart right now, however, What's more important to me is your will. I want to start with your will. I want to end with your will. And he says, you know, if you're willing, you know, if you're willing, but not my will, but yours be done. When I pray your will be done on earth, I'm saying that I will surrender to his will. I will surrender to his will, even though it might seem like evil is winning. Even when it seems like evil is winning, just as it seemed to his disciples at the crucifixion, his disciples at the crucifixion felt that evil was winning, that evil had won. What did they do? They ran and they hid. What did they do when he was arrested? They ran, they fled, they took off. Not a single one stood there with him. What did they do at the crucifixion? They stood back. They didn't come forward. They stood back. They separated themselves. They didn't want to be seen there. They, they were running. And what, what he was saying here, you know, is in those darkest times, I am still going to trust you. I am going to trust you, you and your will for me, and that your will is always right, and your will is always best, even if I can't see it at the moment. So has my personal agenda become more important than Jesus' agenda? Am I obeying the part of his will that is clear to me? The part that is clear to me. Am I obeying that part that I do know? You know, am I following, as I follow, you know, what I know to be his will, as I follow that, am I keeping my heart open to change as he knows is best? Am I keeping my heart open to change as he leads me? And am I willing to set my agenda? Am I willing to set my will aside in order that his will might be better done in me, that his will might be better done through me. 
then a phrase that I always find awkward for us. Give us today our daily bread almost seems very disingenuous when we say that. I mean, it almost seems like, you know, I have food at home in my refrigerator. I have food at home in my cabinets. So do you. It may not always be the first choice of what you're going to eat, but you have food in your cabinet. Before we, before uh, Jenny and I, uh, well, before we left on our family vacation and then before we left for a conference, one of the things we did was, uh, you know, we didn't go grocery shopping. We ate the food that's there because we didn't want anything to go bad. You know, we wanted to use it up. Um, we didn't use it all up. When we came home, there was, you know, and because we didn't do it, you know, so what do you want to have for supper tonight? Well, here's what I want. Well, here's what we got. Well, okay, you know. And we pray, you know, give us this day our daily bread. I, I think at least part of this is a recognition that God is the supplier and the provider of all we have. I shared this verse with you many times, you know, Deuteronomy 8, 18. If you don't have it memorized, you know, this would be a good one. Have it tattooed on the back of your hand, you know, so every time you spend money, you see it. You know, uh, but remember that the Lord your God gives you power to gain wealth. You see, we think sometimes it's all because of us and all because of our abilities. But remember that the Lord your God has given you that power. The Lord your God has given you that strength. You know, give us today our daily bread might be better a statement of thanksgiving from us to God. You know, that statement of thanksgiving for providing for me, even if it is through my job. When I, uh, when I went to uh, quit my job and went to, uh, to Bible college, uh, you know, it was Jenny and I and the two girls. And I thought it was a good idea to feed them. And I thought it was a good idea to pay the bills so we'd have a roof over our head. My plans that I had worked out, you know, as we were coming to going to school didn't work out. I was planning that we were going to have a certain amount of money in the savings account so that if I didn't get a job that, you know, we'd be able to, to get through. Uh, when, I, when I started and made those plans, my bosses had said to me, um, you know, you can, you can work here part-time, and you know what, we'll pay you that full-time rate still. It was a, a great thing. And as it got closer to me walking out that door in August of 1980, um, our boss... My boss came to me and he said, you know, work's been kind of slow. He said, if you want, you know, if you want to stay and, and, you know, not, not, you know, not quit and go to school, you'll always have a job here. That was his words to me, you'll always have a job here. He said, but, you know, if you quit and go to school now, we, we can't keep you on part time. Well, it was pretty clear to me what God's will was for me at that point. We didn't have the money saved. I didn't have a job. And so I walked out the door and started at Moody the next Monday. I didn't have a job for three weeks. No money coming in. You know, God provided I don't remember all the ways. I do remember one of the ways. Uh, good friends of ours were um, studying and preparing to go to um, be missionaries. Yeah, it was in Africa, you know. Uh, but um, you know, so they were, and, and they were going. They were, um, th they were poor uh, divinity school students, is what they were. He was working on his doctorate. Um, at the University of Chicago, horribly expensive uh, school. And um, well, anyway, so, you know, we were always able to help them out. And it was great because they're our friends. Um, 
And I remember they gave us a gift of some cash. And I said, no, I'm not taking this, no. And he looked at me and he said, you need to learn how to receive a gift. God provided for us through those three weeks. And I needed those three weeks because I didn't have a clue how to study. I blew off high school. I mean, I went through, you know, in my last two years in particular, my senior year in particular, I, I had vocational auto shop. Vocational is like, going, you know, you'd spend part of the day in school and then you'd go down, you know, over half my day was there. I, you know, and I, I was going to be an auto mechanic. I've never been an auto mechanic, even then. But anyway, uh, those are my plans, you see. Well, God had different plans. God had, you know, had, had different thoughts, and God directed me in the way he wanted me to go. Was I going to submit to it? Remember, the Lord your God. My sister told me, she said, she said, don't get it, don't get a job. You just stay home. God will take care of you. I said, I, I realize he will but I have no problem with God taking care of me through a job. And after three weeks, he, God gave me a job that fit perfectly with my schooling. Give us today our daily bread. It's a reminder, you know, it's a reminder for us in the same vein that God had to give uh, to Zechariah, uh, you know, and, and he said, not by strength, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Give us today our daily bread. Give us our necessary bread, or our bread to make it through this day, our bread for tomorrow. Give us, you know, we don't live in a hand-to-mouth society like they did, where if they didn't work that day, they wouldn't eat that day. We don't, we don't live like that. You know, I, I see some places now where it says, you know, you get daily pay. They get daily pay not necessarily because... <laughs> Not necessarily because they need it, but because they haven't learned to manage money, you know. And but, but. so I have to ask myself: Has my abundance caused me to forget the gracious hand of God in all that I have? You know, have I lost my sense of dependence upon God? One of the things that walking out of that job did for Ginny and I, and you know, I'm not telling stories on Ginny because she's told me before too, she, and she'd tell you. When we hit that point, she said she realized how much she depended on my job. So I have a lost my sense of dependence upon God. And has the blessing of independence caused me for to get, has, has that caused me to forget God's continued grace in my life? Do I see his provision in my daily essentials? If I think that, you know, about what I have accomplished, I may come humbly before God and have to ask forgiveness for my arrogance. to think that I have accomplished this. What an arrogant thought. I may have to come before God and thank him for my job, thank him for the health, for what I can do. I've realized I can't do all I used to do sometimes or do it quite as well. Been working on some stuff, and as I, when I start working on things, I I don't stop to eat because it gets in the way. I used to be able to do that. I can't do it so well anymore. You know, I I, I thank God for the health I have to do what I am able to do. I need to thank him for blessing me way beyond what I deserve. He goes on, he says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. This is first of all a recognition that I have sinned against a holy God. You know, it is that recognition, I have sinned against a holy God, a recognition that I need forgive, forgiveness. You know, forgive us, forgive me. Forgive me. 
And without forgiveness, you know, through his mercy and grace, I would be separated from God. I would be missing true life. I would be destined for eternal punishment in hell. Not because he's a vengeful God, but because I'm a rebellious sinner. You see, it's not because he's a God who, who hates. It's because he's a God who loves. But I'm a rebellious sinner and turn him away. Forgive me. Forgive me. Paul wrote about this uh, to the Ephesians. He said, so then remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh. What he be, uh, you see, they saw Gentiles as those people separated from God. You were Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by those who called the circumcision, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At that time you were without the Messiah, excluded from the citizenship of heaven and foreigners to the covenants of God and to the promise without hope and with God, without God in the world. Remember, this is what you were. Forgive me. And as we pray this prayer, um, we realize that when we come to Christ Jesus for forgiveness, we are forgiven. We are forgiven. As John wrote in his first epistle, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. He forgives us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, to, to be cleansed, to, be, to, to have that taken away from us. There are some things I can't get clean anymore. We have some stains on our gutters. Oh, maybe you don't wash your gutters. I do. Just the outside. Because there's some stains there that I can't get off, and they bug me. They bother me. You know, Ginny was trying to get some spots off the ceiling yesterday, and she said they won't come off. Well, what we do is we paint over them, you see. What God does is he cleanses. He cleanses from all unrighteousness. Well, that's why Paul didn't leave the Ephesians in despair when he told them about what they were. He goes on to tell them, he says, but now in Christ Jesus. You see, this is what you were, he says, but now, now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away, you were far, you've been brought near, he says. You have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. Forgive us our debts. Forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. I have to ask myself, have I excused sin in my life because of a lack of closeness with Jesus? Have I made excuses instead of making life changes? Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors, as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. Forgiveness isn't always easy, but it is always important. It is always important. A lack of forgiving holds you captive to the past. When you won't forgive, you're, you're captive to that past, to that whatever it is that went wrong. You know, a lack of forgiving holds you captive there in whatever happened before, and you can't get on, you can't get past that. When I pray this, as I forgive, if I, I forgive my debtors, it means I'm going to work on letting go of that resentment that I'm holding on to. So after Ginny and I were married, had two kids, and I was pastoring a church, in walks my dad. I knew he was coming only because that morning my sister had called me and said, you know, Dad's in town. She said, can he? I said, okay, if he comes to church. I said, it's a public building. He can come. 
Now that was on Sunday morning. My sermon was already done. You know what my sermon was on? Forgiveness. And I remember he sat right there. I had already got I had already gotten to the place where I dealt with it, you know, and and I had forgiven him. Um, mainly, I forgave him. I I didn't know my dad well, you know. I mean, he left. I was five when he left, and I didn't know him well. But what I did know is he hurt. He hurt my sisters and my brother and my mother. And I had a hard time with that. I had a hard time with that. I didn't know any different. They did. I don't really remember what it was like to have life in the home where my dad was there. They did. And I had to deal with that, with the resentment I had for him, for what he did to them. I'm forgiven freely by Christ. And because I am freely forgiven, I will work to forgive others. Uh, they owe me nothing. They owe me nothing. I owe God everything. Help me to forgive. Help me to forgive them. Mark chapter 11. And when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. Forgive him so that your Father in heaven will also forgive your wrongdoing. The first verse after the Lord's Prayer here in Matthew, the very next verse says, For if you forgive people their wrongdoing, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. Matthew chapter 5, the pra chapter leading up to this, the, the, the Lord's Prayer, he says, So if you are offering your gift on the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother, and then and come and offer your gift. Do you think forgiveness is important to God? Don't ignore or underestimate the purpose and the power of forgiveness. Forgive others. So I have to ask myself, has my lack of personal holiness hindered my reconciliation with others? Am I holding on to wounds rather than extending grace and forgiveness? Yeah. Am I living like the unmerciful servant who received forgiveness but yet refused to give forgiveness to someone else? You know, is there someone I need to extend forgiveness to? Is there someone I need to seek forgiveness from? Let me encourage you, if God's brought somebody to your mind, right now just pull out your phone and text them and say, I need to talk to you. That's all you need to say. Hold yourself accountable to God. You know, make that commitment and then follow through. He says, and do not bring us into temptation. We're used to saying, and lead us not into temptation. Just so you're clear on this, God will never tempt you. God will never tempt you to sin. He will never. Why do I say that? Well, because that's what the Bible says. It says, no one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God. For God is not tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Now sometimes God does allow us to be tempted, you know, to be tested. He does allow that sometimes. But we have an enemy, you know, who would love to lead us to sin. Both Peter and Paul warn us about our adversary. Peter says, be serious, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Paul in Ephesians, he says, For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. So Jesus tells us to pray like this 
and do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Lead us away from those situations where we are vulnerable. Lead us away from those situations where we might be tempted to give in to the opportunity to sin. God doesn't want us to sin. He does not tempt us to sin. And he regulates, he regulates the, the enemies, the tempters, uh, attempts as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. If you don't know these, write them down. You know, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able he will not allow that. Now, you need to read the rest of the verse. Because some people say, God won't give you more than you can handle. Yes, he will. Don't be so foolish. That's how you learn to trust and depend on God. What's the rest of the verse say? It says, you know, he won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with that temptation, he will also provide a way of escape so that you're able to bear it. He will either provide that way so you can turn and you can walk away or that strength you need to turn and walk away or that strength you need to stay and to stay strong for him. I can never honestly excuse sin by saying I didn't have any choice. You always have the choice not to sin. It's not always an easy choice but it is always a real choice. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So I have to ask myself, has my lack of spending time with Jesus made me vulnerable to other affections? Has my lack of spending time with Jesus made me vulnerable to wanting recognition? Has it made me vulnerable to chasing pleasure? Have I ignored his warnings and just plowed ahead pretending that I didn't see it or pretending that I didn't know? Has working become an excuse for not spending time and drawing closer to Jesus? Do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one for yours. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A desire and goal of living my life to glorify God. You know, making a deliberate choice to live in line with his honor and his glory. Acknowledging his power and his right to rule over me. Have I allowed holiness to slip into a lesser place in my priorities? You know, have I fed my mind with programs and music that glorifies sin or glorifies God? What am I filling my life with? You know, have I foolishly separated any part of my life from coming under the rule and authority of God? Has God been talking to you today? Have you been listening? Have you been talking to him? Are you going to obey? Well, I hope now you have a little better focus on the Lord's Prayer. So what I'd like you to do is grab your outline and let's pray this together. Now use your outline because it's worded a little differently. And sometimes I like reading a different translation than what I'm used to because it helps me sometimes to pay a little bit more attention to it. So it's worded it a little bit differently than how you're used to praying it. So just read it together with me. Ready? Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. 
and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen means so be it. May it be a reality in my life. Father, thank you for your words. Thank you for your care and love. Thank you for your provision, your trust. Thank you for your acceptance when we are foolish. When we do things that go against your word and your truth and you will allow us to come back into your presence. You allow us to come back before you and have fellowship with you. Thank you for being a loving father. Thank you for making us part of a family. I thank you for pulling me and bringing me in to be a part of this family here. I thank you for each person that you have led in to be a part of this church family. I thank you for the love that we do have for one another. May it always be based on you and who you are. May we always continue to keep ourselves open before you. And when we pray this prayer, Father, in the days ahead, when we pray this, help us to do it thinking. Help us to do it with knowledge. Help us to do it with intent and not simply saying words. And in any prayer we pray, help us always to be open to your will and your way. It's not what we think, but it's what you know is best. It's not what we want, but your will be done. May that be more and more a reality in our life and our living to witness for you, our holy God. To you be glory. To you be honor and majesty, we pray. In Christ's name. Would you stand together for the benediction? And as we close today, if you want prayer for anything, uh, Dean is one of our deacons, and Linda is one of our deaconesses. They'll be up front here to pray with you and to pray for you if you need prayer for anything. Or if, uh, well, there'll be other, our other elders and deacons and deaconesses will be watching too. So if you need prayer for something as we dismiss, as we dismiss, if you come forward and uh, they will be happy to pray with you and to pray for you. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to set us before his presence without fault and with great joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and dominion both now and forevermore. And all the God's people said.